So a new breaking report is revealing that the country with the second largest GDP per capita and the fifth largest sovereign wealth fund could be making a move into Bitcoin. So today we're going to be exposing who this country is, why they're important when we start thinking about the game theory of China's Bitcoin backflip. And of course, we're going to be making the connection of why this country is very similar to El Salvador. And they're similar in the reasons that many of you might not actually expect. So to explain all of that, we're going to start with this new article that dropped in the bitcoinnews.com website. Singaporean investors are increasingly optimistic about Bitcoin ETFs. So a new report just dropped looking at Singapore and we can see that 39% of the respondents now view Bitcoin more favorably following this ETF approval. And this sentiment is reflected in the growing awareness of ETFs, with 51% of the people actually uh, aware of the ETF being approved. Now, that's cool and that's cute, but that's not the data I'm interested in today. So we can see here that the Bitcoin ETFs have been a game changer for Singapore, with 48% of the people surveyed going to add more Bitcoin this year. So they're going to be buying some more. So we can see this survey found that 39% of people view Bitcoin more favorably. We can see 48% will double down in the next 12 months. And we can also see that a third of Singaporeans plan to hold or add Bitcoin uh, in the face of high inflation and high living costs in Singapore. Now, to kind of prove my point that Bitcoin is being adopted very rapidly in Singapore, we can see this chart here. Bitcoin in Singapore is at an all-time high, okay? Now, why am I so fascinated about this survey of Singapore? Well, I think this chart here explains everything you need to know. So this is the GDP per capita of Singapore. And you can see it's pretty much flat line between 1870 and 1970. It didn't go anywhere. And then it went absolutely parabolic. And Singapore rose from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being literally one of the richest countries in the world. Now, it's going to have to do with actually something that Bukele is doing in El Salvador. But first, I want to show you a couple of more charts that explain the rise of Singapore. Okay, so we can see that they're a tiny country. Only 5 million people live in Singapore. Some of you guys might be thinking, Luke, why are you even making a video on Singapore if they're so small? Well, again, it has to do with this here. It has to do with their GDP per capita and not a Google ad. We can see that this is the GDP per capita of countries all around the world. And we can see that Luxembourg is the highest at $142,000 per capita. And look at number two on that list, Singapore. $127,000 per year, uh, absolutely incredible. And look, they are the only Southeast Asian country in the top, what's this, in the top 30? I still haven't seen another country from Southeast Asia. South Korea is number 30 on the list, which is interesting. But we can see, you know, uh, Singapore has a GDP above most Western nations and the rich Middle Eastern countries like the UAE and Qatar, okay, they are an extraordinarily rich country, okay? And it is no surprise that Singapore has one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. So we can see here by this chart that this is actually, again, from one of my favorite websites, The Visual Capitalist, and it's showing the largest sovereign wealth funds. So we can see Norway, 1.3 trillion. Uh, it's also comparing a Vanguard market in index here at 1.3 trillion. China's sovereign wealth fund, 1.2 trillion. Then we have a big drop off and we have Kuwait, 700 billion, Abu Dhabi, 650 billion, Hong Kong, 581 billion. And then we have the government of Singapore and their sovereign wealth fund, which comes in at a whopping $545 billion, okay? Again, to put that number into some perspective for you, um, El Salvador's GDP is, I think it's under $50 billion per year. You know what? You guys hate it when I get uh, my statistics wrong. So we're going to be doing it live. I'm going to quickly show you what El Salvador's GDP is. Maybe it's like $20 billion. 
Okay, it's 32.4 billion, okay? So El Salvador's GDP, 32.5 billion. But when we have a look at the sovereign wealth fund of Singapore, it's 545 billion. So it's more than, what is that, about 15 times larger? It's about 14 times larger. Their sovereign wealth fund is 14 times larger than the country of El Salvador's entire GDP. So this is why I think it is a massive deal if we're seeing lots of bottom-up grassroots adoption in Singapore because we all know why El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender. It's because we saw that bottom-up grassroots adoption, which began in like 2018 with Bitcoin Beach. That project was created four years before President Bukele made uh, uh, Bitcoin legal tender in El Salvador. That's not the only comparison we're going to make to El Salvador, but I want to talk a little bit more about what makes uh, Singapore special and a little bit more about this survey because it was an absolute game changer, okay? Uh, we can actually see uh, that 48% of investors are going to double down and we can actually see that 55% of Singaporeans prefer investing directly in Bitcoin rather than an ETF, okay? So these guys are kind of aware that, hey, look, we don't like to actually trust these centralized entities. Singapore gets it. Why is that? Well, maybe that's because of the Southeast Asia currency crisis. Uh, so I'm going to show you guys a little chart here. I might share my screen. It's funny. I was I was running a little bit late for today's video, so I uh, I didn't have this one prepped, but I've just Googled it. I'm going to show you what happened to the, the currencies of Southeast Asia in 1997. Okay, you can see a lot of them got absolutely decimated. This is looking at the GDP, but I'd prefer to look at the uh, currency rates because they, they didn't see hyperinflation, um, but they saw significant, let's see if Google gives me something if I search for significant inflation. They saw very high inflation. And it kind of reminds me of what happened to the Latin American countries in the 1980s when they saw a hyperinflation. Southeast Asia saw this in the late 1990s. Okay. Okay. I can't find... I can't find the exact charts uh, that I want to show you guys, but we can, uh, maybe here it is, collapsing currencies. So most of these currencies lost, what, half of their value in a couple of years in 1997. So you can see they have the Thailand currency, Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Singapore. They're all the currencies they're looking at on this chart here. It's a two-year chart. And have a look at the collapse in value just in the space of literally two years, okay? It happens super quickly, but this is essentially a very, very, very big currency collapse. This is one of the reasons why Southeast Asia does not trust centralized, well, that's actually funny. I, even as I'm saying that, I know that's incorrect because Southeast Asia probably has the most government control, but I think it's interesting that in this recent survey, they don't trust ETFs. Why? I don't know, because America seems to be trusting these ETF wrappers a lot more than South Korea. Okay, so again, let's go back to the survey. That was just a random tangent that I didn't have uh, planned for today's video. Again, I apologize. I can't help myself on the live streams. Uh, but we can see here by the numbers in this survey, 82% of Singaporeans have heard of Bitcoin, 73% of quote unquote crypto investors hold Bitcoin. So that's actually a pretty good number, to be honest. 73% of all people buying digital stuff by Bitcoin. So that's great. 60% uh, of Singaporeans view Bitcoin favorably. 55% prefer Bitcoin over other digital assets. Again, that's not the worst, you know, hit rate, so to say. I know it's, you know, people are always going to gamble. People are always going to be buying, you know, XYZ crap coin, you know, all of that kind of stuff, um, which is very, very interesting. And we can see here that, uh, again, excuse the word, the dirty word crypto, but 52% of Singaporeans are primarily investing crypto to diversify their investment portfolio. Okay. Interesting. Again, 61% uh, who are experienced investors have been in the market for more than five years. Okay. So that means they've hodled through all of the volatility we saw. It, 
Oh, that's a good burp live on air. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Uh, 61% of people have hodled through all of the volatility in 2020 and 2021. So again, this is a massive survey. This was incredibly bullish. The only other survey that I've seen in the world that wasn't as bullish as uh, this one was the one that came out of Turkey. I actually don't think we've covered that one on the channel yet. Maybe I'll do a live stream on that if something interesting comes out of Turkey in the in the near future. But essentially, out of that survey that KuCoin ran, like over 50% of people in Turkey uh, had bought something, whether it was crypto or, you know, Bitcoin, the, the dominant king in the digital realm. So again, that was a massive survey. It was incredibly bullish for Turkey. But I haven't seen a survey as bullish as that until now, until today, until I ran into the Singapore survey, which was absolutely fascinating. Um, so again, how does El Salvador relate to Singapore? Well, firstly, let's kind of explain how and who uh, actually led Singapore through this massive rise of wealth that was created in the country. Again, look at how quickly they went from a country that had an average GDP per capita of like $3,000 in 1960 to literally what? What is it today? It's $120,000 per capita. It's absolutely exponential rise. And I think a lot of it is due to this man here called Lee Kuan Yew. Okay. Um, most people haven't heard of him, especially in the West, uh, myself included until a few years ago. But we can see here, uh, he was a British educated lawyer and he took over the government. And he was famous for actually creating a government that was widely regarded as far-sighted, honest, and effective. Efficient, okay, which is again very interesting. Uh, the result was a tidy, law abiding country, but one that visitors often described as regimented and sterile and dull. Okay, so again, there's a little bit too much top down control, but what he was able to do in the short time that he was uh, leader was completely transform the country. Okay, so uh, we can actually see uh, that he was the president as uh, Singapore announced its separation from Malaysia in 1965. As a result, Singapore gained full independence, the only country in modern history to do so against its will. Mr. Lee set about building Singapore, adopting free trade and business-friendly policies. He cracked down hard on corruption, launched urban reforms and bulldozed uh, slums and enforced multiculturalism in an effort to create a uniquely Singapore Singaporean identity. Okay. So again, we're not going to get into the whole history of Singapore because let's be honest, I'm not an expert on it. Uh, but again, he introduced, you know, free trade in the country. He actually turned Singapore into an exporting country and he opened up the borders. So capital flooded into Singapore and this led an enormous rise in Singapore. Doesn't that sound a little bit similar to what Bukele is doing with El Salvador? Again, both ministers, Lee Kuan Yew and Bukele, have both been criticized for being a little bit heavy-handed. But sometimes, as you can see, if you have a leader who has a good vision for the country, you know, sometimes a little bit of stern leadership can be a good thing, okay? We're not going to get into the debate about why democracy uh, is a shit coin today and why maybe monarchies could be better than democracies. That's a rabbit hole that's going to trigger enough of you guys. So uh, we might leave a whole separate video on that one, but I want to talk a little bit more about El Salvador and the similarities to Singapore. So you can see this article here from Bitcoin Magazine. Can El Salvador duplicate Singapore's road to success? A look at the similarities between El Salvador's policies, plans, since Bukele was elected in 2019, comparing it with Singapore's leader, Lee Kuan Yew, in the 1960s, okay? So few stories in global development are as compelling as that of Singapore, a small city state that moved from the third world to the first within just a few decades. Okay, so we can see that this article kind of highlights a lot of the things that we just uh, kind of talked about. Uh, the, the People's Action Party under the leaderships of Lee Kuan Yew was instrumental in shaping Singapore's developmental uh, trajectory. Through pragmatic economic policies, stringent anti-corruption measures, and relentless focus on public education, the small city state transformed into a global economic 
powerhouse. Okay, so again, this is massive, and this is obviously very similar to what's happening in El Salvador. Okay, so we can see here, Singapore, adopt, uh, Singapore adopted a zero zero tolerance policy towards corruption. El Salvador's political landscape saw a significant shift with Bukele. Bukele aims to also disrupt the status quo, primarily through technological innovation and attempts to root out corruption, okay? So again, El Salvador is doing things very similar to what Singapore is doing. And this is absolutely massive because Singapore, as we've shown, is an incredibly interesting country, okay? They have an enormous GDP per capita. They are very rich. And as that most recent survey showed, they're very interested in Bitcoin, which again is absolutely huge for the country. Now let's move on. And I want to kind of talk about the broader significance that this means for Southeast Asia. Now, I'm not going to rehash everything we talked about in yesterday's live stream, but for those who missed it, let's not forget, okay, we're not just talking about Singapore. We are talking about all of Southeast Asia. Hong Kong is now likely to allow an in-kind creation for its Bitcoin spot ETFs that are going to be launching uh, literally this quarter. We also showed you this chart here uh, from Bitcoin Munga that showed that Bitcoin have been moving from the West to the East over the past couple of months. And we also talked about why Ch China and Beijing is backing Hong Kong's ambitions to become a crypto hub for the world. Okay. Again, we're not going to rehash everything we touched on, on in uh, yesterday's live stream. I'll send you guys over there if you want to watch it. But I think this survey was easily one of the most bullish surveys that I've seen in a very, very, very long time. We're going to go through a couple more quick data points, but I want to obviously hit the live chat. As you guys know, I love to do. Uh, so we can see there's somebody... Uh, 5,000% gain in four years. Uh, that must be the Bitcoin price in Turkey. That looks like a Turkish flag coming from my friend Davino. We've got my man Johnny Minus in the chat. Good evening, Johnny. Uh, glad to see you in the live chat once again. Uh, we've got decentralized data. I love that handle. That's a great name. Wish I could think of something as creative as that. What's up from NC USA? Hello, hello. Um, wonder what time it is in uh, USA. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's uh, it's eleven thirty over here in Madrid. That's probably why I'm a little bit slower with my words than usual. Sorry for all the mistakes I've been making tonight. Den Lass is in Denmark. Bitcoin will go mainstream. The world is awakening. Could not agree more. Lars, very based, very based. The delusion of democracy has always been a shit coin. Tend to agree with you there. Um, uh, and then we saw, when I saw the king last year in Denmark, I just shouted, Bitcoin. <laughs> and the king's driver promised me to mention Bitcoin to her. That's brilliant. I want to hear more from that story, Den Last. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, let's, uh, 331 in Los Angeles. Thank you, Elaine. Good to see you in the chat again. Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about this survey uh, because it was absolutely massive. It's really big. You guys can see how, how far I'm scrolling here. I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, but again, they, uh, they, did they talk about the price of Singaporean dollars? Oh, they didn't, but I already showed you guys the chart. Uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin chart in Singapore is absolutely parabolic, all time highs currently at 93,000 Singaporean, what are they? SGDs, Singaporean dollars. I'm assuming they're dollars. Um, so they're at what? Uh, what's that? 86,000. All time high was 83,000. So they're a good 5% above their all time high, which is incredibly bullish, showing that people are definitely buying Bitcoin in the country, which is absolutely massive. And it's, it looks as if a lot of the people were actually aware of what the Bitcoin halving is. Okay, again, this is massive because a lot of people have no idea what the Bitcoin halving is, okay? And we're seeing it all over the mainstream media. For the first time in a long time, we're actually watching some significant press about what the halving is. Uh, over on CNBC, recently in Australia last week, I saw the national news talking about the halving, but it looks as if the Singaporean people are way ahead of the pack, okay? They've adopted Bitcoin. They're aware of what the halving is. It's incredibly bullish to see what's going on in the country. Uh, greetings from Slovenia. Uh, g'day, g'day. Uh, 3.32 Arizona time. Okay, very interesting. 
Uh, it's a little bit earlier than I thought. Um, no, so, guys, let's uh, talk a little bit more about game theory. You guys know I love to talk about game theory. And the fact that Singapore has a sovereign wealth fund of $545 billion is massive. Something else that's really interesting about this Singapore story is we have massive adoption uh, by the bottoms up, okay? The retail guy is adopting Bitcoin, okay? These these numbers here are very difficult to argue with, okay? We can see uh, 48% will double down on Bitcoin in the next 12 months. 50% have owned some sort of Bitcoin in the future. Uh, sorry, they've owned Bitcoin or crypto, okay? It's massive. But coming from the top down, we're seeing some uh, conflicting messages, so to say. So we can see here, Bitcoin ETFs are approved for uh, are not approved for retail investors in Singapore. Okay, that's really interesting. And they've also come out and kind of uh, reaffirmed their negative stance, okay? We can see that the Monetary Authority of Singapore, a week after the US gave the green light for uh, ETFs, came out and said, look, Bitcoin is very volatile. It's very speculative. You have to stay away from Bitcoin. It's, it's too dangerous. It's way too dangerous. Now, they haven't banned it, but you can see that the... Uh, the Singapore uh, Monetary Authority called it a speculative, volatile asset. <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, and when you uh, scroll down uh, right now, we can see given this, spot Bitcoin ETFs are not approved by the uh, Singapore Monetary Authority uh, for retail investors, okay, which is interesting. But we do know that there are other people in Singapore who are a little bit more optimistic on it. We can see from this article here, that's a more recent one. This is in February 2024. The article I just showed you, I believe it was a little bit earlier. Let me double check. So this was January 2024. So this was two months ago. And then we saw this more recent article come out a month later where it says Singapore and Hong Kong's crypto goals are on track despite challenge from the US Bitcoin spot ETFs. So we can see players are still keen on Asia because of a friendlier regulations and new funds being created in the region. Okay. Which is again, very, very interesting. Singapore and Hong Kong are facing challenges in their bid to become Asia's cryptocurrency finance capital following the debut of Bitcoin ETFs in the US. So again, it's this race. There's this race between Hong Kong and Singapore and many other Southeast Asian players to get into the Bitcoin space, okay? Again, something else that I forgot to bring to today's live stream was showing you a chart that uh, Southeast Asia actually has some of the highest Bitcoin adoptions in the world. It actually does have the highest Bitcoin adoption rates by the world if you actually look at it comparing it to other regions, okay? Uh, from the top of my uh, head, you have had a number of different countries like the Philippines and uh, Vietnam and obviously countries like Laos and Bhutan all in big on Bitcoin. I really hope I can find the chart for you guys live. I can't find the exact chart I want to show you guys. Um, but Adoption is very, 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 very big in Southeast Asia. Uh, we know that the uh, government of Laos is mining Bitcoin. Uh, we know that the government of Myanmar has adopted Tether as a legal tender. We've obviously talked about the huge adoption in Singapore today. Something else, uh, obviously Indonesia. We've also made videos in the past about the Indonesian, uh, what's his, what was his name? The president of West Java, which is a region in Indonesia of 50 million people. The president, uh, what's his name? I've forgotten his name. Ridwan Kamil, that's his name. I remember because it's a fun one to say, but he went to the Bitcoin Miami conference in 2023, I think, trying to bring Bitcoin miners to Indonesia. And obviously that's interesting because Indonesia is kind of split on the uh, matter. You know, some people say Bitcoin's banned in Ind Indonesia, but then you have the governor of West Java, 50 million people, uh, going to the, the Bitcoin Miami conference saying, look, bring your Bitcoin miners to Indonesia. So we have a lot of adoption in Southeast Asia. So again, I think this story of Singapore is more interesting when we consider the broader adoption in the region. Okay, the region is absolutely enormous. Uh, do, would you count India as Southeast Asia? Um, again, my uh, geography skills aren't the best, guys. I'll tell you when I uh, don't have a clue about something. 
Uh, but this is a cool little chart here. Uh, this is kind of ranking the Southeast Asian countries by quote unquote crypto interest. And we can actually, oh, it's a terrible chart. I feel ashamed even increasing the size of that for you guys because it's so disgusting. That's very blurry and very bad. But again, you just you just going to have to trust me on that one. Uh, please don't verify. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia does have very high Bitcoin adoptions. Okay. Now, again, this is all about this is all interesting when we start talking about game theory. Uh, we have uh, Fair Alert likes the Bitcoin manga charts. Uh, who? Who else believes we might see a new all-time high this long Easter weekend as Adam Back asserts, potentially? It's certainly a potential, and Adam Back still believes we're going to hit a new Bitcoin all-time high before the halving. We have about 20 days left until the Bitcoin halving, so I want to hear from you guys. Do you think we're going to do it? I'm not so sure. I'm bullish, but for Bitcoin to uh, hit 100K in the next... 20 days. That's a big ask. And again, you guys know we don't do short-term price predictions here on the channel. We're not about uh, price predictions here on the channel. What we're about is taking custody of our Bitcoin. Okay. Not your keys, not your coins. You know, we talk a lot about the Bitcoin ETFs here on the channel. Everybody's talking about the Bitcoin ETFs, but nobody's talking about the risks of the Bitcoin spot ETF. So again, that's what we're going to try to do. Okay. Uh, if you've got Bitcoin in an ETF, it's not yours. If you've got Bitcoin on exchange, it's not yours. If you you need help taking custody of your Bitcoin. Again, I'm going to continue plugging it. You can book a free call with myself and we can discuss ways for you can get your Bitcoin off an exchange and we can even uh, discuss ways for you to uh, level up your custody and just simply maybe level up from a single SIG Bitcoin wallet to a multi-signature uh, Bitcoin wallet. Um, again, we can book a call and see whether I have a service that can actually help you out. Okay, that's what we're doing at the Bitcoin Advisor. We're trying to drain the exchanges so that people don't have to rely on ETFs. Okay, um, it's just sad that investors are increasingly optimistic about Bitcoin ETFs. So we hope that that's kind of the Trojan horse for uh, Bitcoin adoption and uh, you know all of this pent up demand uh, about the ETFs and hype about the ETFs will actually convert into a lot of self custody Bitcoiners. That's what we want at the end of the day. Uh, so Adam Back has a bet that 100K Bitcoin at halving, 100% correct, Phil. Um, <laughs> the girlfriend's making fun of me in the chat. Um, that's an inside joke I'll probably share with you guys one day. Uh, we can see, okay, I think I've smashed all of the comments in the live stream today. All Night Hider was here before we started. I'm sorry I was late. Um, I was, uh, it's 11, it's 1141 PM over here in Madrid. Um, so I was running a little bit late. I apologize about that. And we got MS Bit. Ooh, they're in the chat. Den Lass in the chat. All right, guys, I think I'm going to cut this one here. If you enjoyed today's video um, and you didn't see the live stream we did talking about China and the uh, – who who else did we talk about yesterday? We talked about Hong Kong's Bitcoin ETFs because I got asked by someone to run the numbers and see how much capital can actually – come in through the Hong Kong Bitcoin ETF. So you can see uh, this is the live stream here that we did yesterday. So you can go check that one out if you're interested. And uh, with all that said, guys, I think that's all I've got for you guys. Uh, I might leave you there and uh, wish you a happy Easter weekend. Is it Easter? I, I honestly don't know. I think it might be because all the shops in El Salvador are closed. I'm trying to get some packages delivered and they're not coming. So anyway, happy Easter. Thank you for tuning in. Um, absolutely love these live streams. We're going to continue doing them every single day until the bull run is over. Okay. And if I can't do a live stream, uh, we're going to be releasing a video. So again, we need to fight the crypto scammery. Uh, Produce Pam says, smash the like button if you enjoyed it. Yes, we can do that. Uh, Den Lass has a long Friday today. Saturday died for, for our Sind. I don't know what a Sind is, sorry. Um, I don't understand that one. Okay, Easter Sunday. All right, guys, have a great day. Um, I'll see you all tomorrow.